Thank you so much. I uh, am very grateful uh, to the organizers for inviting me here, and I'm uh, totally amazed at this conference, how wonderfully it combines some things that are very, very technical, temperature, stress-compensated quartz oscillators, whatnot, and some things that are uh, of the general human interest, like uh, clocks that would last for 10,000 years, and this is really wonderful. I think this is how meetings should be. So uh, today I would like to um, maybe be a little bit uh, uh, more on, on, the, on the general humanistic side and uh, rather on the on very technical side and give you a little overview um, of uh, uh, how we are trying to search for uh, dark matter, to understand dark matter using atomic spectroscopy and uh, nuclear resonance. And uh, I have a somewhat of an ambitious uh, plan. Um, I will start by general uh, introduction, although there are several very nice talks about axion and axion like search particle searches uh, in this meeting, but I, I thought I'm gonna give you a, a sort of a general map uh, of different ways these searches proceed and why to search for them, how and why. And then I will move on to uh, discussing our projects. Uh, one of them is called Cosmic Axion Spin Precession Experiment, or CASPER. And then I will talk about another uh, but related experiment, which is called GNOME, which is Global Network of Optical Magnetometers for Exotic Physics Searches. And then, uh, time permitting, I will tell you uh, about another story about uh, searching for particles called dilatons that uh, also could be part uh, of dark matter. And then I finish up with some general uh, conclusions about this field. So, uh, axions were introduced in the 70s, uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, this axi has something to do, you know, with axial currents and, and, and uh, uh, theoretical physics. However, uh, the real reason axion is called that is because uh, it's, a, it's a famous cleaning uh, fluid. Now, I, I wanted to, to, to find a picture uh, of, uh, of this uh, cleaning fluid to show you. And when I Googled it, I found that it comes in several different uh, flavors or colors here. And, uh, and I think it's very fitting because, uh, in fact, uh, while axions uh, were introduced to address a very specific and unpleasant problem in, par pro problem in particle physics, which is basically that uh, um, the theoretical structure describing strong interactions um, permits uh, large violation uh, of CP symmetry, uh, we do not observe uh, any, um, essentially, <coughs> or any uh, at all up till uh, today. And so uh, the question is uh, why that is. And that was a very big problem uh, that came by the name strong CP problem. And axions, uh, these kind of um, uh, particles, uh, uh, that a pseudo scale, I'll tell you about their properties a little bit uh, later, would uh, uh, make uh, the, the fact that the uh, um, CP violation is suppressed in strong interactions naturally explained. Um, so that's why it was introduced uh, in the beginning, but, uh, but recently it, it, it uh, has been realized that uh, axions could very naturally uh, explain the dark uh, matter uh, uh, issue. Uh, but also, they could uh, potentially explain an even, even bigger problem of dark energy, uh, the, the biggest component uh, of the mass energy uh, constituent of the universe, about 75% is in dark energy. But also, uh, since uh, axions are related to uh, CP violation, and CP violation in turn is uh, closely related to the issue of the baryon asymmetry of the universe, in simple words, is why is that that we only see matter in the universe and essentially no antimatter? Uh, that's a big puzzle, uh, but uh, axions may help here. Uh, and uh, some other uh, problems, uh, for example, why, why are uh, particles that we know um, are of relatively light mass compared to fundamental um, scales of, uh, of physics, such as grand unification uh, scale or, or Planck scale, or whatnot. So all of these things uh, can be addressed by axions, and so that, that's why these different colors are highly fitting here. 
so how uh, one could think of uh, searching for axions? Well, uh, axions, if they are to be a part of uh, dark matter, um, they should interact gravitationally. But um, that's not how we're going to look uh, for them. We're going to uh, look for some additional uh, interactions. Uh, and uh, one of these interactions written in this highly theoretical uh, form here is the term in the uh, Lagrangian. Uh, this term is actually uh, an in interaction uh, of the axion with electromagnetic fields with photons. And this is how uh, most of the current uh, searches um, are proceeding. They use this, this kind of a coupling um, of the axion. Uh, in our experiments, uh, we are using uh, this uh, additional uh, coupling, uh, which uh, <clears throat> is the coupling of the axion to the to the gluons, uh, shown by uh, fittingly by the G uh, tensor. And um, this kind of interaction produces uh, special uh, moments uh, for uh, uh, nucleons and 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 uh, nuclei, such as parity and time reversal. Uh, violating electric di dipole moments uh, that are, though, um, of particular uh, type. They are oscillating dipole moments. I'm going to tell uh, you more about this. And finally, uh, there is another possible uh, interaction of the axion. You see this uh, here. Uh, the A is the axion field. And then we have a derivative uh, of the axion field uh, here. And then it, uh, it, uh, it couples to, uh, to, to fermions. And uh, this is uh, this derivative interaction uh, leads to an interesting effect, which is called axion uh, wind, uh, <coughs> which is basically uh, a quasi-magnetic field that can be uh, sensed by spin precession uh, devices. And this is the basis of Casper wind and gnome. Now, before I tell you more about those experiments, I'd like you to give you a sort of a general uh, picture of the axion surge field. And what you see here is a, is a typical um, uh, exclusion diagram, so to speak, um, where typically here you, you plot the mass of the axion. Here it is plotted in the units of electron uh, volts. And here there is uh, the particular coupling uh, stra uh, strains, coupling constant. In this case, it's the coupling to, to photons, uh, where most of the current searches uh, are happening. And so looking at, at this uh, plot, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a somewhat of a busy plot, but let me walk through this. So uh, this yellow line uh, is uh, what's called a canonical uh, QCD uh, axion. It's like how the axion was introduced uh, in its pristine form, and it lives in this diagram. Uh, so the mass and the coupling are, are related, uh, and uh, it, uh, it, it lives on this uh, kind of line here. And so this is going to be the target. So an experiment uh, is considered a very powerful experiment in this field if it can reach uh, down to this uh, level. And so uh, there are several types uh, of experiments here. So this LSW here stands for something very interesting. It's light shining through the wall experiments. And the way uh, this works is, is approximately this. Uh, so if I shine my laser pointer uh, onto the wall, the photons are immediately absorbed. And so people there are completely safe uh, from my photons because the wall doesn't let them through. However, uh, if there is coupling between axion and photons, we can do uh, uh, the following trick. Uh, a lot in, the, in the path of my uh, light beam, I can install some strong magnetic field. And in the strong magnetic field, you can have a conversion between, uh, uh, um, between the photon and axion. So photon becomes an axion. An axion interacts extremely weakly uh, with matter, and it goes straight through the wall. Now, people on the other side will still not see it. I need to convert it back. So on the other side, uh, you have another strong magnet and then a photon detector. So this is the, the idea for the light shining through the wall experiment. And, and there is a lot of frequency control in this because Usually, um, uh, people have a, a, a power build-up cavity uh, on both sides, and then uh, there is a lot of work that to match the resonant frequencies of the two cavities on the two sides of the wall. So this is one um, type of experiment. Now, there is another type of experiment uh, that is called the helioscope. And this helio stands for the sun. 
And uh, this is basically uh, a light shining through the wall experiment, except what you do is you subcontract the first uh, part uh, of your experiment, the conversion between uh, the photon uh, and the axion to the sun, because the sun has a lot of photons, luckily, and uh, it has also uh, magnetic fields. So then it produces axions, axions come to us, and then we just need to convert them back to the photons and detect the photons. So these are uh, the helioscopes, they're looking for axions pr uh, produced in the sun. And then uh, finally, uh, there is another type of experiment uh, that I would like to mention, uh, mention is the haloscope, and this halo stands for, for galactic halo. So the reason um, we're looking for axions uh, is, uh, is dark matter, as I already said, and, and the first uh, strong evidence for, for the existence of dark matter is, uh, is that, uh, you know, the, the stars in the, in the galaxy, they, uh, they rotate uh, completely differently uh, from what we would expect from uh, Newtonian uh, mechanics. In fact, I remember uh, I was a, a student uh, in uh, Novosibirsk, um, in, and then we had physics in the sixth grade, and we were given this problem, you know, to, to use basically the, the, the uh, one over uh, R squared interaction, calculate how, how the, the orbital speed would depend on the distance uh, from uh, a gravitating object, and you get one over uh, square root of R, if I remember correctly from my sixth grade. Uh, and when you, when you actually look and see what the speeds are uh, at the periphery of, the, uh, of all the galaxies we can look at, uh, usually the speeds level off. It's com complete uh, uh, <coughs> surprise, uh, you know, and, and the way to explain it is to assume that there is some other stuff uh, that, um, that we have in the galaxy and that pr uh, protrudes sort of all the way to the galactic halo and uh, this stuff uh, participates in the gravitational interaction and modifies and, and, and pr produces this rotation curve. So anyway, the halo scopes are, are devices that are uh, looking for uh, these halo uh, axioms. Um, and um, uh, I should say that, um, okay, so back to the, 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 the helioscopes uh, for, for a second. There are several existing experiments, but there is also uh, an ambitious international project called IAXO, International Axion Observatory. And uh, this is about uh, 20 or 25 meter long magnet, uh, four or five Tesla or something like this. And, and this is a large uh, volume magnet uh, inspired by um, the magnets of uh, high energy detectors like Atlas or something like this. And uh, this is all designed to maximize the figure of merit for catching these axions and there are photon detectors over there. And, and this, is, uh, this is a great experiment because it will actually uh, uh, touch this uh, coveted uh, um, QCD uh, axion uh, parameter space. Now, uh, there are some other beautiful um, haloscopes that are actually, um, uh, back to haloscopes, uh, discussed at this conference uh, in great detail. And uh, here the flagship experiment is the IDMX um, experiment uh, in Seattle, which actually has already reached all the way down to the QCD line. And then uh, there is a new version that uh, Berkeley Yale uh, collaboration is pursuing. It's called a DMX high frequency. I think uh, uh, Los Alamos is also involved in this one. Uh, then there is a, a beautiful experiment being set up uh, in Korea and uh, I also uh, uh, heard already, and maybe some of you uh, as well, uh, of another uh, project uh, that is happening in Western Australia. Um, Professor Tobar gave a very interesting talk about this yesterday. And, and the idea uh, for, for, for this family of experiments is that, again, you have uh, a strong uh, magnetic field uh, and you have some kind of a microwave cavity, an axion uh, comes and um, interacts with uh, this uh, photon uh, that represents uh, the strong magnetic field, and then you produce uh, a real electromagnetic um, uh, photon, and then that uh, appears as a, uh, as a little uh, peak, uh, excess power, uh, at the frequency given by the uh, mass of the axion in your uh, detector. Let me now, uh, after giving you the, the map uh, of different axion uh, searches, 
uh, tell you a, a little bit about uh, what, uh, what we are doing. And starting with the CASPER experiment, which uh, was conceived in collaboration with uh, uh, these uh, wonderful theorists, Peter Graham of Stanford and, and Surjit Rajendran now at, uh, from Berkeley. And uh, the experimental details have been worked out with my uh, younger colleagues. One of them uh, is Alexander Sushkov. Um, who is uh, now at uh, Boston University and uh, one of the, uh, uh, I, w I will tell you, there are uh, two uh, parallel installations for the, for the Casper experiment and, and he is heading one of them um, uh, and it's in Boston. So uh, there are certain uh, ideas, I, I, I promised uh, uh, to you that <coughs> uh, I, will, I will explain uh, some of the basic ideas of the uh, Casper experiment and the particular uh, flavor of, uh, of theories um, that are behind it. So the idea um, is that uh, if you have uh, uh, axions and they are uh, scalar, pseudo-scalar uh, particles, then in fact, um, you know, um, if they are to explain the dark uh, matter, and, and for example, in this room we have about uh, 0.3 GeV of dark matter, 0.3, 0.4 GeV uh, of dark matter in every cubic centimeter. So it's, uh, say, a third of a proton mass um, in every cubic centimeter is, uh, is this stuff. Now, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, really light particles. And so uh, if you just take this 0.3 GeV and divide by the, by the mass um, of the axion, which could be a tiny fraction of an electron volt, you get a lot of uh, particles. And so uh, it's better to, to maybe not talk about individual particles, but, but sort of um, an overall uh, uh, field, maybe it's like classical field um, of the axion, except it's a scalar. So the axions were produced in the early uh, universe, um, and they form uh, a potential. And um, nobody said that they should have been produced near the bottom of the potential. They could have been sort of uh, produced uh, uh, off axis, as they, as they some, sometimes say. And because axions interact uh, very weakly with the environment, there's a very uh, uh, slow relaxation of this uh, oscillation. And the consequence of this is that it is likely that uh, all the axions uh, at the universe are continuing to oscillate till today. And, and the um, frequency of the oscillation is nothing else but the mass of the axion. Uh, and then the dark matter uh, can be thought as the energy contained uh, in this oscillation. So um, like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we uh, are not looking for coupling between the axion and the photon. We are looking at another sort of coupling. We want to um, look for interactions of the <coughs> axion with nuclear spins. And uh, our experiment, after we designed it, uh, turned out to be uh, essentially uh, exactly the same uh, as uh, the classic uh, nuclear magnetic resonance experiment. And it works like this. You um, take your sample and you polarize your nuclei along uh, what's called a leading magnetic field. And you want to polarize as many uh, nuclei as possible and have as large uh, as possible density of this polarized spins. And then uh, without other fields, uh, they just sit there uh, pointing along the uh, direction of the magnetic field. Uh, or opposite, depending on the sign of the magnetic moment. Doesn't matter here. Um, now, uh, you then apply another uh, field, uh, which is usually called B1 in um, NMR. And this is perpendicular. Uh, and uh, if this field at some arbitrary frequency, it has very little effect on my nuclear spins. However, uh, there is a resonance. So if this frequency uh, is close to the Larmor precession frequency of the nuclear spins in this external field, then um, what, what happens is that uh, the nuclear spin starts to uh, rotate and deviate from the axis. And because they are in, in this, still in this leading field, they go uh, away from the axis and then continue uh, to, to rotate around the uh, main field. And then we can put um, some detector uh, that will appear, I guess, uh, on the next slide and detect this uh, spin precession. But let me just say that uh, uh, our 
uh, experiments, they, they do exactly the same, except they replace uh, this actual uh, B1 field used in NMR with um, one of the fields induced by the axion. And so if, if uh, we are talking about the uh, uh, coupling uh, to, to gluons, it produces uh, an oscillating electric dipole moment. And if we have an elect a static electric field, uh, then uh, the interaction of this oscillating electric dipole moment with the static field produces exactly the same uh, kind of term as the B1 uh, Hamiltonian in NMR. Or this could be a um, quasi-magnetic field that arises from uh, the gradient of the axion field, and this is the, the wind effect. And then we can put, for example, a squid uh, detector and, and detect this, and uh, this is uh, uh, a team at Mainz uh, who is uh, busy putting this together as we speak. Now, the, these two uh, different types uh, of couplings um, uh, require somewhat different uh, samples. At Mainz, we work with um, hyperpolarized uh, xenon 129, and uh, in Boston, for the Casper Electric experiment, we, we use uh, solid state ferroelectric materials. Uh, like, like uh, for example, lead titanate. So just to recap some of the basic ideas. So we are looking for uh, oscillating uh, axion or axion-like particle fields. Uh, they oscillate uh, at the frequency um, given by the mass of the axion, and, and the ranges we are talking about is from kilohertz to gigahertz. Um, the electric coupling leads to CP violating um, nuclear uh, moments, such as nuclear electric dipole moment, and this is searched by the Casper Electric Experiment uh, at water at Boston. Um, and uh, they also interact through this derivative interaction, and that's the axion wind experiment, and uh, this is happening um, in Mainz. Uh, it is a Casper wind uh, experiment. Now, uh, I should mention some, some, some more properties that, uh, that you will find curious. Um, so the, uh, the axions should uh, should uh, be in the in the galaxy, okay? And um, these are particles. Um, and if they move very fast, they will move faster than the escape velocity from the galaxy, and they leave the galaxy. And we don't want that to happen because the dark matter should be confined uh, to the galaxy. So we can calculate what is the escape velocity from the galaxies, and it turns out to be 10 to minus 3 of the speed of light. So that's what we assume, uh, how fast these particles are moving. And so uh, uh, the, the fact that they are uh, moving with this speed means that there is a Doppler broadening, if you want, or mv squared over uh, 2 addition to the energy. Uh, and this leads to the coherence time of, uh, of this axion oscillator. So if you were wondering, uh, if the axions are oscillating from the early universe, you know, what is, what is the line width of that oscillator? Uh, well, it, the Q is 10 to the 6, as it turns out. That's what we're looking for. Okay, so uh, then maybe uh, I'll quickly show you um, uh, various exclusion plots. So, uh, so this is, again, the mass of the axion, and this is now uh, the coupling that leads to these um, um, uh, electric dipole moments. Um, and this is the, the QCD axion. These are some exclusions that already exist from static electric dipole moment experiment and supernova. And um, this is a, a fundamental uh, magnetization short noise uh, limit. And these are the, the stages of the uh, experiment, Casper uh, Electric experiment, as we foresee them for the next few years. And we hope to reach this QCD axion line in the, in the second stage. Uh, so this is the, the derivative coupling. This is the Casper wind experiment. And unfortunately, uh, here uh, we don't see at the moment. We, we hope to find some, some new ideas here, but we are not going to be able to reach the uh, QCD axion line uh, here. However, uh, there is a, a good news here, because theorists are telling us that this uh, corner here, the unexplored range of parameters, is where uh, a lot of very naturally occurring um, scalar uh, particles um, leave, and they could very nicely um, explain dark matter, even if they do not explain the strong uh, CP. And so 
we have some effort going on here, uh, which, is, which we call Casper Now. Uh, and this is basically taking some existing spin precession experiments and trying to see uh, if we can analyze them in, uh, in different way or, or modify the apparatus a little bit to get the information about that uh, corner of the parameter space. And just as an example, um, uh, our uh, colleague um, Lutz Trams at PTB Berlin, uh, who is the master of this uh, facility, which is um, a magnetic, it looks like, um, uh, you know, modern German architecture building, which is usually cube, you know, pretty much. But uh, this is actually uh, one of the most, if not the most advanced magnetically shielding facility with a multi-layer magnetic um, uh, uh, shield there. And um, this is mostly used for biophysics. This is a, a squid magnetometer and uh, sort of a bench where you can put a poor patient and then measure uh, their heart what's in their heart and, and even what's in their brain. And uh, uh, Svenja Knappe uh, here uh, uh, at the meeting, I don't know if she's in, in here, she, she actually did some beautiful experiments uh, on measuring brain uh, activity uh, right in this room. <coughs> anyway, um, uh, so uh, these guys, they have beautiful um, uh, vapor cells containing hyperpolarized xenon and, uh, and, and, and helium, and they do differential magnetometry, and they have uh, hours of coherence time, and, and these kind of experiments uh, uh, can be used to, to, to um, sort of um, limit that uh, parameter space. So it's very exciting because some of the results can be coming not in a couple years from now, three years from now, but already now. I should uh, tell you, that uh, these experiments are exceptionally hard. Uh, so the um, induced uh, electric dipole moment of a neutron is estimated to be something like 10 to minus 33, 10 to minus 34 in the units of E centimeter. And those of you who are familiar with the DM searches will recognize that this is uh, maybe seven or eight uh, orders of magnitude smaller than the current limits on the neutron EDM. So these are really, really hard experiments. And so, in fact, uh, we have to use all the available technologies to, to um, enhance uh, the sensitivity. And this includes using large spin density. Uh, in the case of uh, the electric, uh, Casper Electric also use um, very large electric fields to enhance the interaction with the dipole moment and long coherence time and all the, all the tricks. And so the first thing that you, you do um, in, such, uh, in analyzing such experiments, you write uh, down various uh, possible samples uh, that you have and see what, uh, what kind of um, uh, advantages or disadvantages uh, the samples have. Um, and for example, uh, th this is ferroelectric uh, solids here. Uh, and uh, you see that all the criteria uh, um, uh, or many criteria uh, are satisfied. In, in particular, um, you can have very, very strong intrinsic uh, fields uh, felt by the by the nuclei, and this is kind of an enhancement similar to that you have in, in diatomic molecules used for uh, precise EDM experiments these days. And then liquid xenon is also um, a very nice system, but uh, the electric field is a problem. And so we are working at the moment uh, to, to try to solve all of these issues in, in a variety of ways. Uh, for example, the issue of applying strong electric field um, to xenon can potentially be solved, we think, uh, by using uh, this, uh, by using chemistry, basically, by putting xenon inside of uh, these special uh, organic uh, cages uh, that are called cryptophane cages that have been shown not to decrease the relaxation time uh, or polarization too much, but this could be made, in fact, uh, if you design them properly to be polar, so there will be an effective electric field acting uh, on the xenon inside the cryptophanes, and there is some uh, uh, R&D that goes on um, uh, spearheaded by uh, my colleague Peter Bloomler um, at, at Mainz. Uh, this is, by the way, uh, the, the Casper team uh, at Mainz, and, and that uh, 
building uh, that my students call Fifty Shades of Grey, Grey for some reason I don't know, is uh, uh, is uh, is our new uh, building uh, where we're going to move, uh, including the Casper experiment in, in a few weeks. And this is uh, uh, the uh, uh, hyperpolarizer uh, setup uh, for, uh, to produce uh, large amounts, one of the largest, I guess, uh, in existence. Uh, to produce uh, vast quantities of uh, hyperpolarized xenon uh, 129, and um, yeah, I use a 100 and 100 watt laser for that, and so on. Um, let me uh, quickly mention uh, that um, there is a, an even um, one of the uh, challenges uh, for extending the the, the the Casper experiment is to to figure out how to um, measure the interactions uh, of axion and ALPS with uh, electrons. And that basically needs a magnetometry um, at a level that maybe a few orders of magnitude uh, better than modern magnetometers. Squid uh, magnetometers or atomic magnetometers can achieve. And we seem to, to have found uh, a, a very strange way to do this. And I, I won't describe it in great detail for you, but just to say that uh, this um, idea has to do uh, with an observation that we actually had already several years ago put as a problem for students in this atomic physics uh, problem book um, that says that if you have a, a compass needle and you put it in a magnetic field, then normally it will oscillate around the direction of the magnetic field. This needle is free to, ro free to rotate in all directions. So you put a needle uh, in a magnetic field, you let it go, it oscillates like this. So we predict that if this external magnetic field is small enough, then the needle will actually precess just like an atom rather than oscillating, so completely different motion. We then go on to uh, analyze what kind of magnetometer you can build out of this with uh, Derek Kimball and Alex Sushkov, and we, we find some uh, really amazing uh, results. We find a T to uh, minus 3 half uh, scaling in, um, of the sensitivity and the overall level. Uh, you can see here uh, for one second measurement of down to 10 to minus uh, 18 Gauss or something. Uh, we, we, we were completely surprised by this, but um, uh, can see nothing wrong. PRL doesn't see anything wrong with it either. It's about, it's about to appear in PRL, so if you like you can uh, read about this on the archive and, and PRL uh, in a few days. All right, so now I'm going to move on uh, to uh, another story. And that is called Global Network of Optical Magnetometers for Exotic Physics Searches. This is uh, Derek Kimball. He is currently the um, coordinator of this large uh, multinational effort. And uh, what we are looking for in this experiment um, is um, uh, another completely different, well, not completely not different model uh, for the dark matter that says that it could be uh, in the form of the energy contained in um, cosmic uh, the main walls of axionic field. You know, if you look uh, on Google for pictures of axionic fields, you don't find very much. Uh, so I, I needed to show you something. I decided to show you sort of the, 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 the soap bubbles that also kind of form the domains, and they have the walls. And the energy here is in, is in the tension of the wall. So the same here um, is with these uh, alt fields. So the idea is now we are talking about alps that do not oscillate, that they ha have relaxed, or maybe they have been produced near the um, bottom uh, of their potentials, but the potential uh, for, for that field is, is, is kind of funny. It has different uh, allowed values for the axionic field. And nobody said uh, that in the early universe uh, when these particles were formed, the, the, the value of this field should have been the same everywhere. But uh, if the values are different in different parts, so you have these regions of allowed values of axionic field, it means that there should be a boundary where one value goes into the other. And this, is, this contains a lot of energy. And the, the model is that the dark matter is, in fact, this energy in the, in the axionic wall. 
Uh, how to detect them? Uh, well, uh, we would, would like to use this uh, derivative interaction that there is, uh, you go from one value of axionic field to another, so there is a large gradient. This means axion wind, the, the derivative of the um, axionic field, and that looks like a quasi-magnetic field. So the, the, just to give you an idea how this works, uh, we have uh, a bunch of atomic magnetometers in different, part, uh, in different parts on, 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 on the planet. Five minutes? Yeah, okay. And we shield them uh, as well as, as we can. Uh, four or five layer magnetic shield. Uh, so they're actually not sensitive to, to the real magnetic field. But uh, these exotic fields, uh, they don't interact very strongly with the matter, so they go very nicely through the shield. Um, and uh, then we, um, what we do is we correlate uh, the, these, the, the readings of these uh, uh, magnetometers, uh, and this way we suppress uh, the, the spurious uh, signals, uh, and uh, also can determine where the wall is coming from. And this is a picture of what we have. We have a GPS uh, timing for all the magnetometers, and they are located uh, here, and, the, and here is the X field, as uh, my colleague uh, decided to, to call it. So we already have some uh, preliminary uh, results uh, that were published in 2013. Um, of this network, um, and uh, we have a, a large collaboration that is uh, growing. We have um, a station at Mainz, we have several stations at Berkeley, uh, Cal State East Bay, Krakow, Poland, um, uh, then, um, you know, Ch China, Switzerland, uh, and so on, and so forth, Korea, and so on and so forth. Um, <coughs> so, um, Many more people want to join this network, um, and uh, if you actually go to our website, you you will see a map of the world, and it will show you uh, which stations are taking data at what time. Um, now there are many extensions to this. Um, uh, this idea of using magnetometers has been also um, um, extended by uh, Derivanko and Paspelov to uh, synchronize clocks, and in fact. Uh, there are efforts uh, in that uh, direction that are independent of ours, but also um, atomic clocks uh, at, for example, PTB um, in Braunschweig um, and um, in some other places are, are uh, uh, also contributing data, so we might be able to, to cross-correlate our magnetometer data with the clock data. And uh, just uh, to give you an idea of the setup, this is one of these magnetically um, shielded, uh, magnetic shielding enclosure. Uh, at Mainz, and this is the laser system. So these are not sophisticated uh, apparatus, and so well, there could be a lot of them um, around the world. I should actually say that the magnetometers we use here um, uh, could could come in in, in, a, in a variety uh, of sort of uh, flavors, and this is not related uh, directly to GNOME, but I just wanted to show you this nice picture that a magnetometry uh, of, of the type we do uh, for GNOME can also be done on the sky using the uh, laser guide stars and this shows, uh, this was taken basically a few days ago at the Tenerife where we were doing one of these magnetometry experiments with the sodium. Um, okay, I'm running out of time. Uh, there is uh, uh, another model um, uh, for dark um, matter, and this was proposed by Asimina Ranitaki and her students, um, and we've done an experiment in this prosium that I don't have time to, to describe to you. Um, uh, this is an experiment that is uh, looking for a temporal variation of fundamental uh, constant alpha, and the prediction of this dilaton dark matter theory is that, in fact, uh, this variation should oscillate in time. Uh, at the mass of the dilaton. Now, dilaton is even lighter than the axion. It could go all the way down to 10 to minus 2 uh, or, or, or something, electron volt, and that's, uh, that's like in an inverse year or something like that. And so we were able to actually uh, do very nice uh, exclusion. Um, here, improving by like four orders of magnitude some of the previous limits. And uh, in our paper that we published uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we pointed out that actually you can do much better 
uh, with uh, modern atomic clocks one year ago. And uh, in fact, I'm very pleased to see that um, um, our French colleagues at, 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 at CERT uh, um, are already producing the data uh, that is in some respect better than these prosium limits. Here we went down to 10 to minus 2 electron volts. And uh, this is uh, an analysis of a five year uh, data set and it goes all the way to 10 to minus 3. So this is a field that has um, um, a, a rapid progress and there is a lot of interest from theorists and, and you can use these data to um, uh, limit a lot of um, different models. So I'm, I'm coming to uh, just uh, the conclusion. I'm, I'm basically done. Um, so there is an apparent uh, uh, connection between the, the field of searches for dark uh, matter and, uh, and dark energy and the field of fundamental uh, symmetries because these fields that form the dark matter and dark energy uh, can basically mimic the violations and so uh, cause transient and oscillating uh, effect that we are looking for. So that's the connection. And again, this is the uh, energy, mass energy balance of the universe. And uh, Emmy Noether is chosen here to represent the field of fundamental symmetry uh, tests. So uh, I started my talk saying that there are a lot of problems in fundamental physics uh, that can be solved by axion. And this, is, this goes under the rubric of killing uh, two birds with uh, one stone. In fact, I think uh, I argued that there's maybe five birds that can be killed with one axion uh, stone if we are lucky. And so uh, light axions may solve all your problems and we are looking for them. And uh, I didn't have to, uh, time to go into great detail about this, but, but uh, this uh, dysprosium dilaton search and I believe the, the, the French uh, comparison between cesium and rubidium um, uh, clock data over five years actually uh, do not require doing uh, dedicated experiments. In the dysprosium case and I probably in the third case, there, there's just been uh, carefully uh, time stamped and recorded data on disk. And then as you have uh, models uh, for exotic physics in your head, you go back and you analyze them and you produce uh, physical review letters. And so my, I urge uh, I uh, urge anybody who is doing uh, any kind of precision experiment, it's so cheap these days to, to store uh, things on disk and to GPS or, or otherwise timestamp them. Uh, and please do this because uh, there may be a lot of publications uh, that you are not thinking about now. And uh, with that, I will conclude and thank you again.